Um, so Matt is a Matt Wilson is a small farm production advisor with Grow Appalachia, a program of Berea College, where he works with farmers in Eastern Kentucky. Matt was fortunate enough to have served as the organic farming coordinator at the Berea College Farm, which is one of the oldest continuously operated student farms in the country. Wanting to dive deeper into perennial agricultural systems, Matt studied edible forestry systems during graduate school at the University of Illinois. He is the primary author of Perennial Pathways, Planting Tree Crops, published by Savannah Institute and available through their website. Matt's family owns and operates a small farm in Garrett County, Kentucky, where they raise poultry, honeybees, sweet sorghum syrup, and tree crops. <laughs> so Matt, thanks for being with us today. Sure thing. Thank you, Brooke, and thanks to the rest of the Oak team. I'm, uh, I'm just continuously blown away with um, the amazing job y'all have done. So let's dive right in here. Can everybody see that? Okay. okay. Um, so I hope you're here for the agroforestry session because we're going to be talking about trees. But before I get started, I just briefly wanted to share about an agricultural service that we now have here in Kentucky that um, I think would be really useful to a lot of organic producers. Um, so I've got it, the info here and um, I'm looking at it. So this service can help increase the long-term uh, financial viability of your farm. They've got um, help for developing new sales strategies, new sales opportunities to open up markets, and um, they can give assistance in complying with organic regulations. Uh, one of the things I'm really excited about um, is this, they've got this novel product here that um, I just wanted to share briefly. It's um, something that I've been using for a while now. And I've talked to a lot of producers that have tried it and are happy with it. So I'm just reading here. Um, so this can make your crops more drought tolerant by reducing water usage. Uh, if you lay it down next to crop areas, it can purify runoff water and prevent erosion. Um, if you use it right, it reduces the risk of exposure to pesticides. Um, they've got some research to show that beneficial wildlife are attracted to farms applying this product. And, um, it looks like it can even be used on livestock farms uh, where it increases animal comfort and weight gain. So anyway, no negative health side effects. It's, um, it's OMRI approved. And um, as far as I know, it's available pretty much anywhere here in Kentucky. Uh, the really crazy thing is you only have to apply it once and um, it can last for years. The benefits can last for years. So um, really excited to share about that. I know it's a little hard to see on the jug there, so I've got um, I've got the product info here. It's um, it's trees. It's not something you buy in a jug. It's trees, right? Trees can do all of this stuff. So we're going to be talking today about how we can get all of these benefits uh, by integrating trees into our farms. So, like a lot of you, um, I got into organic agriculture because I care deeply about. Um, our planet and our intersection with the natural world and how we can provide for both human needs and, um, and nature. And, um, you know, I think we all understand that there are still some challenges in organic agriculture that, um, that we're, we're working to overcome. And I wanted to share a story, you know, a few years ago that kind of made this really clear to me. Um, and it stuck with me. I was sitting on a tractor plowing and you know this was on, a, on an organic farm and we were transitioning out of that cover crop phase into our grain growing phase and you know I'm looking back checking the, the furrow and I see something white in the you know dark soil. I'm like that's weird you know we don't have white rocks or anything. So I stopped the tractor and I get off and I walk back and I had cut right through a buried nest of um, snapping turtle eggs. And as I stood there <laughs> and watched, you know, these embryonic snapping turtles dying because I just cut right through them, I thought, this is, <laughs> this is organic, right? This is the way we're supposed to be doing this, but yet, you know, what, what's happening here? And that kind of got me onto a pathway to explore, all right, what's the next step for organic agriculture? We've come a long way. Um, you know, in a lot of ways, we've made great strides, 
what can we do to improve what we're doing? So one metric we can look at is greenhouse gas emissions. If we consider agriculture's role in greenhouse gas emissions compared to things like worldwide transportation or electricity generation, agriculture actually contributes more greenhouse gases. Um, in fact, farming is the leading human caused contributor to climate change, uh, accounting for about 35% of greenhouse gases we emit. And most of this is coming from, you know, tropical deforestation and rice methane from livestock and nitrous oxide from over fertilization. Uh, but I really wanted to look at how does organic stack up with conventional in this. And I spent a lot of time uh, looking into this. And in a lot of ways, organic farming gives us improvements for things like organic matter in our soils or biodiversity. But overall, when we look into the, the research on comparing organic systems and conventional systems, and their contribution to climate change, whether they're a net contributor or a net mitigator, um, we, we basically find that organic and conventional are both uh, contributors when you're talking about annual crops. So the line here seems to be not between organic and conventional, but between annual and perennial systems. And um, you know the studies that look into this find that uh, when you're, yeah, that, that's, that's kind of where you're, you're, you're either contributing to climate change or you're mitigating it. Um, I really appreciated uh, John Bell and, and Dr. Krista Jacobson's talk when they were really talking about this balance of, you know, we're putting it into a perennial and it's building up, but then when we put it back into an annual system, we're losing some of those gains and where those balances are. And they're measuring that over time Today, we're going to be talking about spatially. How do, we, um, how do we commit parts of our farms to stay in that perennial system, get some of those benefits, while also still um, engaging maybe in some of the annual agriculture that we need? Um, one, one note I wanted to say is that when they looked at these perennial systems and, and natural systems, the most mitigation effects came from systems that were um, early successional. So it's these grasslands that are growing young trees, they were, um, they were uh, capturing the most carbon. And um, the systems that we work with in agroforestry actually mimic those early successional systems. So it's really exciting. Um, this is your like, take a breath moment. I know some of that can be kind of heavy when we're talking about the, the effects of ag. So here's your kittens. The good news is that we, if we, if we integrate trees on our farms, um, even on a modest scale, we can, uh, we can offset more than a third of US emissions uh, from coal, oil, and natural gas. And that's you know, in addition to all these other benefits we were talking about. So what is agroforestry? Well, it's basically just trees and other stuff, right? It's the crops, it's the livestock, there's a whole spectrum, but when we say agroforestry, it means we're intentionally integrating trees into our landscapes. And of course, people have been practicing this, practicing this for a long time. And I really want to acknowledge um, Leah Pinneman and her reminder in the session uh, that she did that um, many, if not most of the agricultural practices and especially those that are regenerative have indigenous roots and people have been doing it for a long time. So there's a number of products that we can get off of agroforestry, and we'll be getting into some of these things. Um, but I want to go through some terminology just real quick. If you start to dig into agroforestry, you start to hear, you know, alley cropping and silvopasture and forest farming, and how are they all different? And I just, you know, there's a lot of overlap. It's a spectrum. And, um, but if you hear me use these terms, it just means, you know, it's all agroforestry. Um, this is a, an example of what they call alley cropping. So this is soybeans and, and trees. So this, you know, this would be more of a, on a large scale with, with trees. Here's another example with wheat and hybrid poplar. Um, so these systems are going in and on, on scale. You know, this isn't backyard stuff anymore. Here's another example of alley cropping with um, oak and, uh, and grapes in the Mediterranean. And when you integrate livestock with trees and forages, it's called silvopasture. 
And then we've got forest farming. So this is where you're growing something or harvesting something under your forest. So these are shiitake mushroom logs. Ginseng would be another example of a, of a forest grown product. Trees along a waterway, we call that a riparian buffer. And then of course, windbreaks are another way we can use trees. And then the, you know, the kind of uh, quintessential permaculture food forest is another designation. But again, you know, I, I'd say don't get hung up on the terminology. This is all, um, all a spectrum. So we see all of these really awesome benefits that trees can do. They're really multifunctional. And um, an example, you know, I just want to dig in a little deeper to what it would, how we can compare a perennial system with an annual system. So in this uh, example, we're using chestnuts kind of as the mature overstory, trying to mimic a natural forest, right? We've got hazelnuts as sort of the understory tree or shrub, and then currants at the ground layer. And of course, when you have a perennial system, the roots are, are growing every year. They go really deep. They're able to capture more, um, more fertility and more moisture. They can take up um, things like pesticides or fertilizers if they're in the system. They have a bigger canopy, so they're capturing more of that sunlight. You know, we've heard over and over uh, during this session how important it is to be photosynthesizing, right? That's what keeps the biology alive. That's what's capturing carbon. So if you have this multi-strata leaf layer, you're capturing more of that sunlight. And then we have these cultural benefits, you know, people and trees have been together for a long time. And, uh, you know, the, the foods that come off of tree crops tend to be higher density, uh, nutrient wise, more healthy for us. So some very practical uh, benefits to trees, it, you know, some of you are familiar with this document, it's the organic system plan, it is a certified organic producer, you end up filling out every year and under the national organic program we have to uh, meet certain requirements. And one of those requirements is a buffer uh, between you and anything that could potentially compromise the integrity of your organic product. Fertilizers, uh, pesticides, uh, GMO pollen, things like that. And so this, you know, you don't have to read this whole thing, but this visual is just, you know, trees are a great way to do that, right? You can stack multiple types of trees. You can use, trees um, that provide different functions and, um, and, and make that buffer uh, possible. You know, it's, it's up to your certifier what it means, what you need to have, and it depends on the crop and who's next door and all that stuff. But uh, trees are a great fit for meeting this requirement. Um, historically, farmers have recognized uh, the benefit, especially things like uh, um, windbreaks. You know, this was a Dust Bowl in 1934. There was this drought and some farms lost the soil, their soil eroded in the plow depth. So they lost, you know, eight to 12 inches in a single year on their farms. I mean, can you imagine that? So, you know, this kind of awakened our national imagination of, oh gosh, we really should be using trees to protect our farms. And with climate change, you know, hopefully we never see a dust bowl situation again, but we're gonna continue to see these erratic weather patterns. Um, in, for windbreaks, uh, the kind of a rule of thumb is for the height of the windbreak, you get benefits for 10 to 15 times that height into your field. So the yield, you know, right next to your windbreak, you might get a slight yield depression, but uh, further into the field, the yields actually go up. And this can, this is measurable. They have economic models for this. Um, so they keep the moisture in, they keep the soil from eroding, they can prevent wind damage. And, uh, and provide an opportunity for alternative crops off of that windbreak. So some of us remember the 2012 drought. Uh, I was growing corn that year, organic corn, and you know we're a little closer to the mountains, so we didn't totally lose our crop. But there were you know there were folks mowing their corn out west, and um, but it can be an opportunity too. So we had a harvest. We sold corn that year for fifteen dollars and fifty cents a bushel. So if you, can, if you can implement some strategies that give you just a little bit more protection or make your farm a little bit more resilient, there can be um, not only ecological, but economic benefits to it. Going back to our organic rules, um, you know, we have to implement practices that maintain or improve our natural resources. So that's soil and water quality. And trees can meet a lot of these 
requirements. You know, you can check a lot of boxes off on your um, on your SOP and um, getting these benefits on your farm. So we can talk about alternative markets too. How many of you are doing vegetable production or a CSA? How much fruit do you see people selling? You know, at our local market, there may be some strawberries or some blackberries or something, but by and large, uh, I think there's a huge niche for fruit. And, you know, part of this is it's kind of hard to grow fruit in Kentucky, you know, especially organically. And we'll talk about some of that. But, um, you know, think about maybe there's some ways that you could integ integrate fruit as a market, um, increasing market in your, in your area or a fruit CSA or something like that. Value added products come through here. Uh, of course, things like maple syrup or jams and jellies, these shelf stable products, right? Dried fruit, uh, fruit leather. For, for things like pawpaw or persimmon, we see folks making that into a pulp and freezing it. And they can turn it into things like pawpaw ice cream. If any of you have been to the uh, third Thursday thing at uh, KSU, maybe you've gotten to taste some of that. It's amazing stuff. And then ornamentals is another outlet. So this is willow. You know, it can go into the uh, woody ornamental um, uh, florist trade or basket makers. Some folks are interested in this for the cuttings themselves to plant. And of course, the more diverse our systems are, we get these pollinator benefits and the benefits to increasing our resilience to pests and diseases. And you can integrate different systems here. So this is a cover crop. We did a project on our farm uh, with a SARE grant where we were looking at using cover crops and uh, sweet sorghum and chickens as a way to establish an organic orchard. So we use walk behind equipment here we planted cereal rye and then when we planted our trees in the spring, we cut and raked the rye as a mulch uh, to provide weed control for the trees. But then that also allowed us to um, create sorghum. So this was our cash crop. And we also had a plot where we were um, planting cover crops that would produce an edible seed that we had chicken. And then we also got the seed off the top of the sorghum that you can't press. Um, and we fed that to the birds. So here's what it looked like when they were growing. Stuff grows really tall. It's like 14 feet tall, tons of biomass. And you end up having to handle that anyway as you press the juice out. And this is um, uh, KSU's uh, sorghum press, really great. They, they let us use our press for this project. And uh, we, we ended up with all this residue that then went back onto mulching the trees. So it's kind of this cool, you know, there's lots of opportunities to see where the synergy lies. Uh, you can continue to crop in between your trees while they're growing. So this is potatoes on that same plot uh, this year. And, you know, you, when you're planting trees, they only take up a small amount of space at the beginning. So you can continue to use the in-between for alley cropping for lots of years. Other folks are designing perennial systems with this multi-strata layer from the very beginning. So this is Saturn Farm in Illinois. It's uh, by Midwest Agroforestry Solutions. I got to work a little bit on this farm when I was in grad school and they're doing some really cool stuff. So they're, they're growing chestnuts on about a 30 foot row. And in between each row of chestnuts, they've got two rows of black currants, which are one of the only fruits that can actually produce in the shade and better in the shade. Um, black currants are really well known in Europe. And there's a whole story there about um, white pine blister rust. It's in interesting, but I don't have time to go into it. Um, so they're doing black currants. In between their rows of black currants, they're doing um, other perennials like asparagus and rhubarb. And the really cool thing about this is they're, the whole system is meant to be um, harvested by machine or on scale. So, you know, again, these systems are, are scalable from backyard all the way up to commercial farm. A black currant harvester that kind of harvests half of a row at a time. It sort of bends the bushes over and tickles the berries off. and um, and they planned it so that the, the asparagus and stuff go in between the wheels and they're still able to harvest the currants. Really innovative. Um, thing to kind of prevent competition is root pruning. So you can drive a subsoiler through there and it prunes the roots so that it's not competing with your crops early on. How many of you have ever seen this situation on a farm here in Kentucky? Um, so we, we rely on, most of us rely on tall uh, fescue as the primary forage here. 
And um, anybody that, you know, a lot of you are familiar that uh, fescue is typically infected here. About 85% of our fescue is infected with an endophyte that causes cattle's um, problems with their circulation. They can't regulate their body temperature and they wanna cool off. So they go stand in the pond. The solution here is not just to fence off the pond. I mean, that's a good start, but then your cattle are still affected by this endophyte. Um, you know, the, so you know, a lot of us have seen this too. There's one tree in the field and everybody's standing under it. Um, this tree isn't gonna last long. They're gonna compact the soil. They're gonna rub against it, over fertilize it. Um, this is a risk for lightning too. Uh, you know, in the rainstorm, they all go under one tree and then it gets hit by lightning and that's all she wrote. So we need to introduce shade um, and some of the benefits of shade I'm gonna go through here. So we've got good research on the benefits. Uh, one study here in Kentucky found uh, about a pound and a quarter increase above cows that don't have shade. This is in the summer, a daily increase. Um, calves made almost a half a pound more and steers almost a pound more um, above and beyond those cattle that didn't have shade. We see this especially when there's endophyte infected fescue. Another study in Missouri showed almost uh, three quarters of a pound of increase per day over cattle that didn't have shade. It can affect pregnancy too. So for our cow-calf folks, this is really important. 40% um, higher pregnancy rates in the shade. And you know you can look at artificial shade and providing that, and it does provide some benefit. We see about a 20% increase in daily weight gain under artificial shade, but with trees, it goes up to 60%. It's not the same to have an artificial shade structure as it, as it is to have trees in your pasture. Uh, they can provide some benefit in the winter too, living barns. So these are typically evergreens. It protects them from wind. You know, they're, if they're not shivering, they're not using up as much energy, right? So they're putting on more weight or conserving weight. You definitely want to pulse graze so that you're not doing the same thing as your single tree in the field here, but a uh, useful tool. So in addition to the benefits to your livestock, you're getting these alternative crops off of the trees, right? Fodder is one of them. So the actual leaves of the trees that the plants are eating can work with some species. Uh, timber is the obvious one here. You know, this is kind of a, a quintessential uh, pine plantation. We tend to see these farther south. Um, Long-term proposition, fence posts. You know, especially for organic farms, if we can grow our own fence posts, you know, that, that uh, makes things a lot easier. Things like black locust or cedar. Uh, firewoods, you know, obviously in here, if you're heating with wood. And then, of course, the edible fruit and nuts we can get off of these things. So there's two ways to start silvopastures, basically planting trees in your pasture or cutting trees out of your woods and adding grass. Um, if you are planting trees, you're going to have to protect them. And, you know, different livestock fit in different ways. So chickens are a great fit. Obviously, they're not going to tr trample trees. Um, a lot of times they're moving, you're moving net anyway to keep the predators out. So you can keep them off the trees if you need to, or they're in a you know, mobile cage. Uh, sheep work pretty well if you, you put tree tubes on. Uh, you got to stake them well, but that can be a good fit. Cattle are a little more difficult. Usually people are doing wire cages. Takes usually three sturdy posts to keep them out. You know, a thousand, two thousand pound animal can push a lot over. So takes a little more effort. And goats, uh, <laughs> I have not had good experiences with goats and high value trees. Maybe yours has been different, but um, I, I, we've got about a hundred year, hundred plus year old apple tree up next to our barn and our farm. And I went up one winter and the goats had stripped off about a third of the bark off of this apple tree. And um, suffice it to say the tree is still there and the goats are not. Uh, you can use electric fence. The big challenge here is that <laughs> um, long alleyways, which is typically what we're pasture is incredibly inefficient to fence, right? So th these two kind of paddocks are the same area and it takes more than twice as much fence to do a long skinny thing as a square thing. So keep that in mind if you're thinking about fence. Another strategy is to cut hay until, you know, the trees are mature enough to handle that. Um, I would recommend keeping the hay on your farm, feeding it back so you're not losing those nutrients. Got to have a plan for deer, especially if you've got um, you know, things that they really like to eat. They'll uh, rub on, even the bucks will rub on the young trees that they don't eat. So we use, I, I usually recommend this three strand electrified poly wire. It's fairly simple. It's not 100% bulletproof, but it's much easier to implement. So this is kind of the, 
um, you know, keeps them from jumping over and when they go under, they get zapped. If you're planting into pastures, you can also consider adding tree forages. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of bushes and, and hedgerow styles that you can put in that actually provide benefits. Um, this is a picture of a, an agroforestry farm I went to in Wisconsin where they were cutting, they were growing hybrid poplar, very fast growing, and they were cutting it for firewood for a local um, national or uh, state park. And kind of by accident, uh, they found that when they cut, they had, they had a drought and the guy was cutting the trees for firewood and the sheep all came over and cleared the leaves off of the tree he had just cut. And, um, and so they integrated that into their, their management. Now they cut during the summer when their forage availability goes down. The sheep eat the leaves off of the tree. It makes it easier for him to see the branches and everything. And then he cuts, a, cuts it up to firewood afterwards. So some opportunity there. If you're interested in that, I really recommend this book by Steve Gabriel called Silva Pasture. And there is, um, do check out the Whova app. There is a, um, a resources sheet that have a lot of these references and info in it. So if you're cutting the trees out of the woods, uh, your target is about a 30 to 50% shade. And um, it's, you know, it looks like a park. I mean, it's a really beautiful landscape. What you want is enough sunlight for the trees to grow. Um, one drawback is that unless you're using that wood that you cut out in some stable form, like lumber or you're making biochar, you are releasing some carbon. So that's something to keep in mind if that's important to you. Um, here's where goats shine. You know, if you have honeysuckle or multiflora rose or some of these other nasties, um, they really are great at clearing out that brush. So best practices, rotational grazing is not negotiable here. You have to do it um, in a silver pasture system. Of course, you always want to match the livestock with the land. And, um, you know, especially if you're cutting trees out, work with a forester, um, get in touch with your NRCS agent. You know, there can be some, some benefit here to having uh, like a, a timber stand improvement. Some, some practices that can help you do it. And then of course, be safe. You know, if you're not comfortable running a saw, um, it's trees are great. It's not worth dropping one on your head over. So which trees? Um, I would say the, the primary thing here in Kentucky is get trees that are pest and disease resistant, primarily uh, native trees, if you can, right? Because then they're going to benefit the, the local wildlife and everything. Uh, American persimmon is one, and I, I'm not going to get into timber trees too much here. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them that work and are great. Um, I'm primarily going to focus on fruit and nut trees. So American persimmon, um, if any of you have ever had one that was unripe, you know what it does to your face. It is so astringent and it can put people off of persimmons for the rest of their life. So uh, what you usually have to do is let it fall off the tree, which splats the persimmon. So people that are using this, um, they'll, they'll do things like spread straw underneath the trees, let them fall in the straw, pick them up, sanitize them, pulp them, sell them as frozen pulp. Pawpaw is another one that's great, um, grows really well here. It's a native, um, highly perishable. So, you know, you stick it out on your counter and it'll be mush in two or three days. So we typically uh, pulp these and freeze it too. Mulberry is another one, pretty bulletproof, um, easy to grow, very few pest pressures, uh, can be turned into jam, they can be dried, a lot of potential with mulberry. Jujubes, also known as Chinese dates or jujubes. Uh, these things are bulletproof. Uh, this year, this spring, which we had that really weird frost that all of us <laughs> probably dealt with, uh, you know, some of the old reliables like persimmons and chestnuts got even got frozen out. Our jujubes here in Berea, at least, were fine, put on a full crop. Um, these things taste kind of like a date when they're dried. You can eat them fresh. They're really sweet, almost like an apple, very crispy. Love jujubes. Asian pears are another potential um, organic crop that work well here. They tend not to have the same problems with pests and diseases. You do have to thin them. Uh, apple pears is another name for these. So let's talk about nuts. Chinese chestnut has got a lot of attention right now. We have a uh, huge demand in this country. We import about 90% of our chestnuts every year. Uh, primarily folks that are um, have uh, Eastern European or Asian descent have this chestnut as part of their culture. So a lot of opportunities there. The big caveat here is that in Kentucky, we have chestnut weevils. These are endemic. They were, you know, part of a symbiosis with the American 
chestnut that we no longer um, have because of blight, you absolutely have to deal with this thing because people have zero tolerance for wiggling weevils in their products. So um, the way we do it is give it a hot water bath, 20 minutes at 120 degrees. Um, this is a schematic out of uh, uh, Empire Chestnut, Greg Miller, and they've got directions on how to do this. It kills the egg. Um, so you, you harvest your chestnuts every day, every other day. And as long as you do that and give them a hot water bath, the egg comes off with the, with the shell and you have a, a good nut still. You know, you might get one every once in a while, one out of a thousand nuts that has a weevil in it. As long as it's dead, people tend to be tolerant of, you know, every once in a while you've got a bad nut. If it's alive, forget it. Northern pecans. Um, pecans grow great here. The trees grow great. What the, the trees from, you know, the southern varieties will do just fine, but they won't fill out their nuts here. So you have to make sure you get varieties that have that shorter harvest window. Heart nut is another one to take a look at. This is a Japanese walnut. Uh, cracks out really easily. There's some novelty in the shell. You know, people are selling the shells uh, for six bucks a pound because they look like a heart, you know, so um, interesting one to keep an eye on. Hickories grow great here. Tastiest nut I've ever had. Uh, not quite at the commercial level here, but um, they certainly are native and, and grow really well. If you're interested in nuts, I really recommend looking up uh, John Strang's, uh, there's a, a slideshow on nut tree growing that's excellent. We've also got really good publications from the University of Kentucky on nut tree growing, check them out. Moving on to berries, elderberry. Uh, there's a lot of people looking at increasing elderberry right now. The market for things like elderberry syrups and um, value added products is really blowing up. It's a native, it's good for pollinators. It's fairly easy to grow, easy to propagate. And we have a cooperative out of Missouri that will do wholesale purchasing. Blueberry, we just had the blueberry session. I think um, I don't need to go into that anymore. Lots of potential there. Blackberries, especially early varieties, you know, with the spotted wing drosophila, um, for all of these small fruit crops, you're gonna want to have this on your radar and have some strategies to, to deal with it. But, um, you know, specifically try to get those early varieties because it's active later in the, in the year. I've got some crops that are kind of maybes and you know maybe they're unproven or you got to make sure you're thinking about the right things. Asian persimmon is one of those. Um, the fruit quality on these are a little bit bigger and sometimes they're, they have varieties that aren't astringent, um, but you got to make sure you get the cold tolerant varieties. They're right on the edge here. Apples and pears for cider are another one. You know, I don't recommend them for fresh eating organically because it's just hard to get that nice fruit, but um, there's some, you know, you don't need perfect fruit for making alcohol. Hybrid hazelnuts, there's a lot of buzz around it. We're getting there commercially, um, and maybe in the next few years, that'll be something that really to look into. Right now, it's hard to get the, the varieties that are improved. Um, they're hard to propagate. We're working on it, but not quite there. Black currants are another one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with them here in Kentucky. They tend not to do well where it's really hot, but, um, worth looking at, again, because they can produce in the shade. Hascap, honeyberry, this is actually a honeysuckle, dare I say, um, native to northern areas. Again, may not be, it it's really likes to be in the cold, so they're just starting to come out with varieties that are, are tolerant to the warmer areas, worth looking at. American chestnut, you know, we've got these um, hybrids now too, um, more as a timber tree, but could be kind of fun. And then Saskatoons and service berries. We do have native service berries. They tend to be more of a tree shape. Uh, birds love them. I actually prefer Saskatoons over blueberries. They're just a really tasty. Again, get varieties that are made for lower um, latitudes. They, these guys grew up in the cold too. Uh, again, UK point, pointing to their uh, variety recommendations, really good. They've got um, things that do well with minimal pesticide. Here, things that I do not recommend. Again, apples for dessert, uh, fresh eating. Um, it's just really hard to get that high quality product under organic management here. I don't know of any organic apple orchards in Kentucky. I would love it if somebody does know of it, I'll, I'll visit, but kind of hard to do. Stone fruits, cherries, plums, peaches, these all bloom early and you're, you're likely to lose your crop. They also tend to have pest problems. Grapes require tons of spraying in general uh, for disease, especially wine grapes. And then European hazelnuts. So these are the, the ones that 
you know, are in most of the commercial production. We have Eastern filbert blight here and it just wipes them out. So, um, you know, as you're thinking about this, you're gonna wanna look at your soil uh, test or soil test for sure, but also your soil type. Um, this is soil web, I really like it. You can also do web soil survey. It's the same data set. So you get the same information, drainage, soil type, farmland class, really important things to be looking at as you're planning. And drainage is one of the big uh, pieces of the puzzle here. So there are some things I recommend only for well-drained soils. Apples is one of those, unless you're on a rootstock that can handle a little bit wetter feet, like maybe M111 or something like that. Chestnuts need to have dry feet. Um, if you do do stone fruits, they gotta be up out of the wet and black walnuts as well, they're gonna be productive. There are some things that you can put in slightly wetter areas. I would avoid something like this picture, standing water. Willow, blackcurrant, honeyberry, honey locust. Um, and that's an interesting one, especially if you're a sheep producer. I can talk more about that one-on-one uh, -on -one if you're interested. Not the ones with massive big thorns. And persimmon. And moderately well-drained, everything else. You know, it drives me crazy, like, uh, <laughs> when you try to find out what something can tolerate, you know, everything is, they recommend, well, well-drained, loamy soil. It's like, yeah, tell me what it can handle, pet peeve. Okay, frost. Uh, some things you're going to want to look at uh, the frost. And so, you know, we've got these, if you're halfway up the hill, you're going to be up out of that frost pocket on cold nights, that cold air drains and pools. And um, it can, just a few degrees difference can make, make the difference on whether you get fruit or not. So we've got some frost tolerant things um, on our list here. Make sure that you can, you know, put these guys where it's going to be more of a challenge. One thing we also want to look at is timing. So harvest timing. Um, this is going to be especially important if you are looking to integrate livestock, like they're going to come in and pick up the fallen fruit, or if you're doing you pick. What you don't want to have is, you know, stuff all over the farm. And it's just, you know, you got something over here, over there, over there that's ripe now. You, you know, that doesn't work with livestock fencing. It doesn't work with trying to tell somebody where to go pick. So try to group your fruits or your harvest date by the same date. And that way you can rope off a single area and you're all good. I will say that, you know, important here is using cultivars that have a known harvest date. If you use seedling cultivars, you're not going to know what that is. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You can also use harvest date to spread um, labor out, right? So some things are ripe early. Labor is obviously one of the biggest um, inputs to any agricultural system. So you can kind of think about this and figure out how you're going to spread that labor out. Again, we got a great publication from the University of Kentucky. Check it out on ripening dates. One thing to keep in mind is the uh, uh, equipment distance. So if you're making tree rows and you're going to mow or something in between, try to make it multiples of your equipment width. You don't want to run your tractor for, you know, like this much mowing on every single row. Uh, we have some planning tools. You know, a lot of this you just end up doing on paper and research and books. I tend to use Google Earth and I use the standalone Google Earth Pro. It's free. You can do, you know, area and field boundaries and all that. I also use SketchUp as a way to get it spatially explicit, you know, when I'm actually plotting out trees. Not going to go into too much detail. I actually did a whole series on this for the Savannah Institute. It's available for free on YouTube. Check it out. So getting plants. Um, you know, like I said, most fruits and nuts are grafted. We do this. So if you want a gala apple, you go cut a stick off of a tree from a gala and you get a root stock and you graft it on, stick it onto that tree. And then the tree that grows from that is going to be a gala apple. We do this for almost all of our fruits and nuts. And it, it's, we get a known quantity. If you plant these things from seed, the genetic diversity makes it so that we don't really know what we're going to get. Um, what that means is that these trees can tend to be a little bit more expensive to buy. Um, it, it's well worth it, but those those nurseries have to, um, you know, have to make it worthwhile. So it takes a couple of years, takes some work. So you can learn to do this um, and save some money. You can also order bulk, so buy more than you need at first, and maybe sell or share the rest of it. It's one strategy. Learn to graft again. Uh, you know, before COVID, we used to have half a dozen grafting workshops going on in Kentucky every spring. Um, I'm sure that'll pick up again, or you can learn from YouTube or somebody that knows how to do it. And then there are ways to propagate your own plants um, that don't require grafting. A lot of our shrubby um, plants, especially, you can take cuttings or 
Um, you know, there's different strategies for these here, but um, they're all possible to buy a few, plant them out, and then propagate from there. Um, I, there, there is a list of nurseries that are recommended um, that I've worked with in, here in Kentucky. I'm not going to spend too much time. UK also just knocking it out of the park. Uh, they have this new map for nurseries that have the varieties that they recommend. So check that out. This is also in that Whova publication on, um, that I've got uploaded. Uh, Dave's Garden Watchdog, check it out. It, it, before you buy from a nursery, look them up on here. It's like the Amazon reviews of nurseries. So you can see if they're terrible or not. Really nice tool. Um, and then planting. The old adage is don't put a $25 tree in a $1 hole. Spend the time to do it right because you only get to do it once. So you can do it by hand. You can use an auger. Usually when people are using augers, you want to score the sides of the hole because it, that auger can actually sort of smash it flat and then the roots have a hard time penetrating. Uh, you can use a tree planter, put a lot of things in the ground quickly. Basic idea here, dig your hole bigger than you need, make it three times as wide as deep you don't want to plant anything deeper than it was in a pot or in a nursery. Put the mulch on it, make sure it's protected by, uh, from rodents and uh, keep everything watered and moist until you get it in the ground. And then afterwards, take care of it. You know, make sure it's protected from critters. Uh, if, you, if you're not worried about deer, you at least need a rodent guard. So this would be quarter inch hardware cloth, at least you know, a foot, 18 inches tall for rabbits and bulls. I am a big fan of mulch. Uh, this was from a study that we did up in, in Illinois. We put wood chips down on the left. We didn't do anything on the right. Um, that picture kind of speaks for itself. Well, the data spoke for itself too. Our trees grew twice as tall and twice as wide in a single season with mulch than without mulch or with mowing. So mowing isn't really a strategy for controlling competition. And then of course, um, you know, some things like planting the uh, trunks white after this is especially true for things like pawpaws. This can prevent sun scald, prevents the sap from running early and then freezing and, and breaking the bark. Uh, and depending on your tree, you might have to do some training, you know, to make sure those angles are right or pruning. And this is you know, specific to the species of tree you're working with. I can't overemphasize the importance of budgeting here. You know, find the enterprise budgets, put the pencil to paper, put your butt in the office chair, do whatever you have to do. Um, get a budget for each crop. You know, these are long-term crops and they're going to tie up some of your money for a long time. And so, you know, find some help. Um, if this is something you need to make money at, you got to do the planning. And then funding. I, I, you know, I'm going to go over stuff that other folks have already done here, but, um, you know, amazing. Re the Natural Resources Conservation Service, I always tell people it's the branch of the U.S. government helping farmers do the right thing. They're just really awesome. They've got a number of uh, practices that can be applied towards silver pasture. You might have to work with your local uh, NRCS agent. They may not be as familiar with using these practices uh, for agroforestry, um, but, uh, but they're there and, and I, I definitely recommend that you get in touch with them. Uh, Kentucky State University Small Scale Farm Grant, a lot of you have already taken advantage of it. They now have an agroforestry pri priority area. So um, really awesome. It's $5,000 per category. You can get it up to twice, I think, in different categories. They also have a fund for educational expenses like this conference. And then the Kentucky Hort Council has a small fruit uh, initiative going on. And this is for berries and grapes and things like jujubes. Uh, they've got, got, you do have to work with a technical assistance provider. Your you know, extension agent can be that, or we can do that at Grow Appalachia too. Um, some counties have CAPE. This is the County Agricultural Investment Program. It's, it's county specific because it was tied to the tobacco uh, um, settlement fund and, and that it's up to $3,000 a year typically. And you wanna ask at your local extension office. Sometimes it's administered through your extension office. Sometimes it's a local uh, conservation district. And then once you've you know, kind of exhausted the, the grant, um, we've got a Kentucky Highland SOAR loan that's 1% interest. You pay only interest for the first year, can be up to $7,500. You know, no, they're not making any money off of this. It's um, kind of an amazing program, easy application. And then, yeah, we've got, I, I'm just amazed at how much amazing um, support we have for, for farmers here in Kentucky. Take advantage of all of these as you consider what you're gonna do. Uh, finally, we've got a program at Grow Appalachia called the Direct Integrated Grower Support Program. 
Uh, this is my full-time job. There's one other person on staff, Chris McKenzie. And if you're in one of these counties and you're actively selling or trying to sell a farm product, we can come out and help you on your farm. We do a farm visit. We can do soil tests and, you know, we chat about what you want to do and then work together to come up with a plan to take your farm to the next level. And we certainly don't have all the answers, but we're connected with a lot of smart people that, that might. So um, get in touch. Again, we've got lots of resources coming out of the University of Kentucky Center for Crop Diversification. Check it out. Um, this book that we talked about, um, Planting Tree Crops, it's available as a free PDF, or you can get a hardcover copy from the Savannah Institute. It's got a lot of uh, Farming the Woods is a great primer for some of the agroforestry things I've been talking about. This one, Tree Crops by J. Russell Smith is a hoot. It's um, originally published in 1929, again in 51. This book is actually one of the things that started the permaculture movement. And it's just really fun to read and very visionary, this guy, J. Russell Smith. Check it out. Again, the Civil Pasture book by Steve Gabriel and then um, the Savannah Institute. Really visit their website. They've got an annual con, kind of the premier um, nonprofit working in agroforestry right now. Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri has a lot of great info. They've got an annual agroforestry school. They've got a master's degree in agroforestry if you wanna do that. And then the Association for Temperate Agroforestry also does um, a conference. A lot of good YouTube content. Check out uh, Cornell Small Farms. Check out Savannah Institute. Um, there's a lot of great info out here on how to get started. Thank you so much for, for coming today and, and talking trees with me. Um, that was a lot of content to move through. I'm happy to, to keep this conversation going in Hoover and um, just in general, you know, this is my job, uh, farmer support. So I love talking trees with folks. Matt, thank you so much. That was awesome. I can't believe you got through all hundred and <laughs> however many slides. That's awesome. I'm impressed. <laughs> um, Y'all, if you were watching the chat at all during that time, it was just filling up with lots and lots of um, resources. Everything that Matt mentioned, Jenny was either dropping in there or saying, go look in the Whova upload. So there's a lot of resources there. And there were a couple other things shared um, that I want to point out. Um, my chat bar went away now that you stopped sharing the screen. So I got to go over here. Um, Sean Lucas at KSU said, don't forget about the pawpaw resources at Kentucky State University. They yeah. are the USDA pawpaw germs germplasm repository and breed new varieties there. Um, so there's a lot of resources there. Sherry Crabtree is a good co uh, contact mm -hmm. there um, if you're interested. And all that's in the chat. So grab that. Um, OK, let's see. We're going back up here to the questions now. Um, OK, it's just sort of like rapid fire. You've seen how we do this. So are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> OK. Um, Brittany says, you know, uh, trees can be expensive. Can you share some resources for a good place to purchase reasonably priced trees, which you did, um, mm -hmm. or the feasibility of starting your own trees? I guess, could you just talk a little bit more about, just spend a little bit more time on that part of it? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's this kind of co this cost benefit balance, right? It's going to take time for you to grow your own trees. Um, it's not particularly difficult for a lot of them, but, um, you know, you might lose a year or two doing it. I love propagation. It's like magic to me to see <laughs> trees growing and, you know, grafting is like just crazy. Um, I learned how to do it and I really enjoy that. Um, you can get the seed for cheap and for a lot of things, especially nuts, uh, and some fruits, you start the rootstock by growing the seed first. So that's really inexpensive. And iron wood, if it's a grafted, something you need to graft, a lot of times, you know, from an orchard, uh, you can just ask permission and they'll let you come cut. You, you don't need much wood. Um, or you can buy cyan wood from, from nurseries and that, that ends up being a lot cheaper. Um, you know, the Kentucky State Nursery has a lot of native plants and they're really inexpensive, especially if you buy, you know, 100 at a time. They're little, little guys. And, you know, I would say if you, if you want to plant 50 trees, maybe get 75 or 100 and pick the best ones out of there, you know, but you pay a buck a piece or less. Uh, so that, that's a really great thing if you're looking at native trees or even those can be rootstock that you're grafting on to. So on the, um, in the vein of getting new trees, are there grants or bulk group ordering resources for tree tubes? 
especially used ones. Last year, someone asked um, DNR if there were programs for getting tree tubes for farmers, landowners, and there wasn't anything happening in that space yet. But that's a that's a good question. Um, programs I mentioned for funding. You could use that funding to buy tree tubes. Uh, it, there are some limitations on some of them with buying the trees, which is kind of crazy. Um, but you know, it comes out of the idea that they don't want producers using grant funds for annual expenses like buying seed. They want it to go towards things that are going to last longer. So I understand the the thing there. But tree tubes, I think, can be you, you know one of the things you could get under the probably the KSU grant um, in RCS. Some of those practices could go towards it. Um, yeah, it's a good question. And, you know, if anybody needs help crunching those numbers, sometimes it makes more sense just to put a, a deer fence around the property than it does to put tree tubes on the trees. And, you know, I'm the first one to admit they can be a hassle if you need to prune or things like that. But you definitely don't want to plant trees out with any kind of deer protection unless uh, I'm pretty much anywhere. I mean, the deer are going to find it. Yeah, they will. Yes. Um, okay. Lexi asked, any ideas on how to rehabilitate existing forests into an agroforestry system? For example, uh, she has a degraded forest on the property that's highly invaded with honeysuckle, et cetera, and has many dead ash trees. How would I go about transforming this land? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing this with ash all over the place, right? Uh, they're going to have to come down or, or they're going to fall down eventually. So if you can harvest those trees and use it um, as, as timber or as firewood. Um, that's a great thing to do with that. As far as the honeysuckle and those things, you know, here's again where goats shine. If you're, um, if you're into, into using livestock, they can really clean that up. You might have to get in there and cut, uh, cut some of that down so it's within reach. There's a really great publication by Mark Kennedy, and I'll make myself a note to share it in Hoover. He was an NRCS agent in Missouri and um, has a presentation on exactly how to use goats for um, invasive species control. You can also rent like an agroforestry or a forestry mulcher. You know, it's like a skid steer bobcat with a big grinder on the front. And, you know, you want to take out a couple of acres of honeysuckle in a, in a day or two, you can invest in that and really um, have kind of a quick turnaround there. But you know, the um, most folks are, are using animals or they're just in there with a, a chainsaw, taking it slowly and and uh, renovating that little by little. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I just want to point out there's someone, uh, Mary Kate Glenn said she grafts pawpaws, persimmon, Asian pear and apple varieties suited to the Ohio River Valley. Reach out to her if you're interested in more on that. I also know Blake's on the call with Peaceful Valley, uh, Peaceful Heritage Nursery, um, and he's a great resource for, for perennials as well. Um, let's see. Next question um, from Lisa. Is there any particular variety of jujube that you would recommend? Yeah, I, I would I actually. I guess, Lisa, drop in the chat too where you are. That might matter, but yeah. Well, I was going to say, I'm no jujube expert. I, I would defer to um, Blake there at Peaceful Heritage or uh, Clifford England at England's Orchard. They both have experience with jujubes. Oh, it's Lisa. Lisa, I know you. I, just, I was just going by the first name. Sorry, I'm reading the notes. Um, she's in Franklin County, but uh, she heard your reply there. Thanks, Lisa. Um, okay. What are your suggestions for keeping critters from eating your apples? The actual apples uh, or the tree, I guess. Would well, I be guess my... we need the clarifying in the McCall, uh, Mc, uh, McFall is the participant. And um, if you can drop in the chat there, if you're thinking about keeping critters from eating your tree or the actual yeah. apples. The definitive um, answer there, I guess, is it depends on the critter. You know, if you're talking about deer again, you, you've got to have deer fence. Um, that's and. You know, I would say if, if the, the crop that you're interested in, if deer are going to be eating the crop itself in the future, it probably makes sense to invest in deer fence early on, right, to protect the trees themselves. So apples are one of those, chestnuts are another one. You're going to have deer in there eating your apples up. You got to have a fence. Um, you can do things like, you know, egg washes or hang in soap or you know, there are some strategies that don't use hard fence. Um, I think people have had different um, a different success to that. Dogs. If you have dogs, that can work. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, 
-hmm. Well, that's actually Kelly. She was saying the first har harvest they had something got the apples off the tree. So she's wondering squirrels. Um, they were just Could like all they were all gone. They have dogs, and so there's no deer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Could be squirrels. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Blake dropped in there a few varieties of jujubes he would recommend. So I gotta find I, this chat window is so tiny in this view I can never <laughs> find it and scroll it. Uh, Lee honey jar sugar cane. Sean Z Lee are good jujube cultivars for Kentucky. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Love all you're doing there. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Okay, a request from Anna. Can you talk a little bit about wood-grown medicinal plants? Sure, yeah. So um, the real, the, the main one here people are talking about is ginseng, right? Obviously it's kind of the, uh, what's in the, in the media and in the news and it's, you know, it's a native, there's real, uh, um, both economic and thing. People grow it typically in three ways here, um, and I would only really recommend one of them, and that is in wood simulated. So you can actually make beds and amend them and all that in the trees, plant your ginseng. Um, what tends to happen is your roots look like carrots. They, you get, um, they're much lower value per pound. And so what most folks that are, are doing this here is, is you know, you essentially grow it like it would have grown in the woods. You rake back some leaves, you poke the seeds in typically. You can start with um, uh, rootlets if you want earlier production, but they cost more. You rake the leaves back on and you leave it until um, the roots have grown. The big challenge here is, is poaching, right? That's you, you know, some, some years ginseng runs as high as $1,000 a pound. And um, that's pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty attractive. So you gotta either, you know, and people talk about either don't tell anybody and, you know, really try to protect it or you tell everybody, tell all your neighbors that you're growing ginseng. If they see anybody with a, you know, muddy knees and a backpack, let you know. Um, and, you know, plant in lots of places. Ask your neighbors if you can plant it on their place, spread it out. Uh, you, you don't really want a lot of ginseng in the same place either for, for pests and diseases. So, you know, typically they recommend interspersing it with some of these other medicinal herbs like golden seal or um, cohosh. They don't have quite the market that ginseng does, but they provide some other ecological benefits, um, make it more of a resilient system. And uh, yeah, there's a great book. Um, I will put it in the chat too. It's um, yeah, I, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but there's really good uh, uh, ginseng resources out there. Awesome, thanks for that. Well, a clarifying question on the ginseng, or I guess it's uh, just the next, the next step in that question. Um, what could be grown around the ginseng to sort of hide it or obscure it, protect yeah. it? That would be yeah, beneficial. that's a good question. You know, I, I, I don't know specifically about what to grow around it. Um, you know, obviously ginseng does need shade. And so there are trees that, uh, you know, that kind of have a better environment. One thing that I have heard about um, from some of the experts in ginseng up in Pennsylvania, they said whenever they're doing a ginseng project, um, they'll cut branches or, you know, maybe it's part of a thinning and they'll they'll plant the ginseng and then kind of pile brush around it. And if you can do something like, you know, if you have a bunch of black locust or Osage orange, um, bramble, something like that, where you can pile that over your ginseng, it makes it a lot less likely, not only for people to want to go in there, but for deer, they don't like having to, you know, step over stuff. They can't get their noses down in that. So that seemed like a pretty interesting way to, you know, to, to protect that. And of course, it takes seven, 10 plus years for that to be a viable product. So by that time, you know, hopefully some of that's broken down so that when you go to, uh, to harvest it, you don't have to deal with the, with the tangled branches and stuff. Good question. Uh, Linda Cross shared that NRCS has a program for honeysuckle elimination. They pay you per acre. There mm -hmm. are people for hire who will do this work for you. 
contact your local service center for more information. I didn't know about this. Have you heard about yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great program. We actually did that here at Berea College for several years. Um, it's an invasive species removal. Now, you know, your local agent is um, probably more familiar with the part of the program where they're going to want you to cut it and then spray an herbicide, the cut and squirt. Um, and, you know, I'm in general not a big fan of herbicide use. I think this is one instance where it, it makes sense, but if you're, you know, certified organic, that's going to come into play there. I think it is on the books, and some of the NRCS folks can chime in here, where you may be able to use biological control. And so there's some leeway. I know that in other states, they've, they've been able to work with their NRCS agent to use goats. The challenge is, you know, for something that's woody like that, they've got a lot of energy stored in the root systems. And so if you cut it back once, you're just going to take it off. You know, it's going to grow right back. So you've got to have multiple um, insults, right, to that plant in the form of mowing or goats chomping on it or whatever, maybe for multiple years until it's gone. So. And that's a good point on the herbicide and you know with a lot of local agents if you reach out to them and you you just want to be real upfront about what your production system is and you know say that you're trying to follow a certain guide the in a national organic program guidelines if that's the case and they'll they'll find the right people to help you but feel free to question as you go um, also on that note though if you even if you are a certified operation and you have a honeysuckle issue in your woods um, you can have your crop land certified organic and you're not necessarily certifying your woodlands, right? And so that is compatible as long as you're all of your management strategies and all of your paperwork um, is clearly states what your plan is, right? Um, yeah. So I just like to remind people of that um, option. Okay, that's, so that's Matt, um, we are one minute over time and this is the part of the day where we have really tight timelines. So what I'm gonna propose is if y'all have more questions for Matt, go ahead and put them into the Whova session in that Q&A in the Whova session and Matt will hop over there and reply there. He's already added some replies to previous questions there. He's got all those incredible documents, the PDFs with all the resources. So definitely check those out. You can download those. You can come back here for up to a year and get them here. Um, Matt, any closing remarks? Just thanks y'all and thanks Oak folks. Um, I hope you do plant trees. Yeah, go forth and plant, right? We'll Thanks. see you around. <laughs> Thanks so much, Matt. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Take